So today we are talking with 3D artist and designer Sakani Solomon, uh, fresh off the release of his new film called Star Wars The Last Stand, uh, something that I'm affectionately describing as probably the greatest Star Wars fan art in the history of the, the franchise. Sakani uh, is a great guy, an incredibly talented artist. I'm sure you know his work. He's mentored with us at times uh, at MoGraph Mentor, working with students, inspiring them, teaching them. I'm um, so very happy to be speaking with Sakani again. Sakani, thank you so much for taking some time. Yeah, dude, no problem at all. So I want to start off by talking about the film. It's uh, as we're speaking here today, 10 days into the new year, January the 10th. Um, already over a million views. I predict this is easily going to run up to 10 million views, um, which is just in crazy and incredible achievement. The film is beautiful. Definitely check it out. We'll have it embedded on this page here with this podcast. Um, but Sakani, first, I know people are going to be interested. Let's just run over technically how you achieve this film with such a small team. Let's just quickly run through the kind of tools and what your process was like to build something um, like this. Yeah, so the first thing you have to know is the tools you're working with and the constraints, right? The one thing I knew is that I had no money, so I knew finding resources would be difficult. So I also knew most of the things I would be doing, I would have to do myself. So when planning the film, you kind of have to plan production with all the constraints in mind. So that was step one. So I was like, okay, let me list some of the things that I need to do. Uh, I know there's going to be a bunch of characters, so there's going to be some craft animation involved. So how much craft animation I can do, hence the reason a lot of the film is in slow motion, because it's so much easier to animate things slowly than in like real time. So that's like one thing I had planned. Uh, another thing was, I know there's some parts that need to be sped up, so I just kind of went to mix them more and reference some of the animations that they had there knowing that that would kind of been a base and I would probably have to tap one of my character animation friends to kind of get those up to actual production quality. So again, it's kind of like looking at all the constraints and then figuring out the best way to approach the project. But software wise, uh, Cinema 4D was a bread and butter. That's kind of where I did everything in. Um, they had a lot of FX in there as well. So I use Houdini for a lot of that. With, uh, X particles being a huge help in some of those scenes as well. A uh, substance painter for like the stormtrooper grit and textures. Uh, what else did I use? Obviously, rendered in Redshift, my current favorite renderer, and Nuke for compositing. It's it's such a beautiful film, and it definitely makes sense. The kind of slow motion shots. It brought it brought to mind for me the movie Three Hundred, Zack Snyder's film about Roman soldiers. There's all this like fast action, and then it goes into these slow motion shots that are just so epic. I feel like your film had a very similar kind of feel with all the slow motion shots, but then the effects are so detailed and so beautiful, um, and the lighting so good. I think another thing that jumps off the page too is just the way that you kind of did the look on the stormtroopers themselves. They're very gritty, much grittier than we normally see them. Um, you know, you start out with that that close up. You're also showing us things we don't typically see in the Star Wars universe. Uh, maybe people will correct me. I don't know if we've ever been inside the helmet of a stormtrooper in the way that you open the film. Um, and hats off to, I believe, it's Tauros. You had doing that kind of user interface design on that opening shot. Um, and then taking us inside the blaster too. That just absolutely blew my mind. I can't believe we've never seen inside of a blaster before, but the way you interpreted it was just so beautiful and so interesting. Um, give us the inspiration for why you wanted to show stormtroopers in this way and to make this film. Yeah. So for me, I always thought stormtroopers are really cool, but every time you see them on film, they're a little bit incompetent. They never are hitting their targets. They never really seem like they're living up to their full potential. So a huge part in making this project was to portray stormtroopers how I see them, as like these war-torn or battle-worn super soldiers, essentially. And I know because there's so many fan films, I needed a way for this film to stand out. So that was a huge part in the conceptualization stage. Like, what can I do differently from everything else? And for one, I wanted the approach to be different, using very dynamic camera moves, but almost making a lot of the film feel like one shot. 
So up until that part where that stormtrooper explodes, it's more or less one flowing connecting shot. And that's something I had to plan. Also because my film Hidden was such like a shot based project, a lot of slow motion, I was like, okay, for this one, I want to just kind of switch it up, make it a little bit more fast paced, make it a little bit more dynamic. Um, but it was also fun to, you know, depict some of these things that we haven't seen before. Like, again, how does the inside of a helmet looks like, uh, the, the HUD interface. And it's fortunately, I'm friends with Toros, who is like a HUD master designer. I tapped him to help me make that. And he did such a phenomenal job that made it so much easier for me to just kind of go in and animate that and, you know, bring it to life. And also, like, how does the inside of a blaster look like? I kind of reference, um, uh, why am I backing off on the name of this? Oh, lightsabers, yes. So I reference like the internal workings of a lightsaber. So I was like, it would be cool if these particular stormtroopers had like these supercharged uh, lasers that use kyber crystals. Like, even though it may not necessarily be accurate to what the usual stormtroopers was, I'm like, this is my film. I wanted to take some liberties to make it as cool as possible. So I just like, let me throw this dark kyber crystal in there and just pick that, see how that looks. I think it turned out uh, pretty cool. Yeah, it's um, it's probably my favorite shot in the film. It's so, so cool um, and interesting to see. So as I, as I said in the beginning, it's already over a million views very, very quickly. Do you have any crazy stories yet of, of like people reaching out to you or feedback you're getting on the film? Oh, yeah. Like people are reaching out to me daily for just various things whether it be uh artists wanting me like music artists wanting me to make music videos or like, yesterday a voice actor reached out to me saying if i have any need for someone to do voice acting in anything uh, he's available from composers just various different people reaching out for various different reasons um also the feedback has been phenomenal it's interesting because you get these uh, comments where people are saying, oh, best on the last three films, uh, this film has, uh, brought more justice to Stormtroopers than any of the films has. There's like a lot of comments uh, like that. The, the feedback has been phenomenal. And it's good to see that, you know, the film's being celebrated and everyone really respects the effort that was put into creating it. Yeah, as soon as I watched it, my mind immediately went to like, he's going to work on something in, for actual Star Wars <laughs> at some point. Like, I'm not going to be surprised if you're, if it's a title sequence, if it's just something in that universe, because I think you did really bring a really interesting um, perspective into it. Give us the timeline on this. How long were you working on this before you rolled it out? So the interesting thing about this project too like how it started i don't think i would have imagined it would have turned out how it is right now because it kind of started off as a gag uh when i worked at imaginary forces um the it guy um alid alid jones he loves star wars so it's just like oh wouldn't it be cool to just buy you a jedi outfit and put you into like a cg world and let's make this silly short about you fighting stormtroopers and that's kind of like how it started. And over time, like I started it, the environments looked dope. I started like shading the stormtroopers and then it got shelved. I was like, the other projects are coming up and then hidden came. So that just got completely shelved for the entirety of, uh, I think 2018, 20, no, yeah, 2018, it got shelved and half of 2017, but I had some of the assets made. And then by that time I was like, Hmm, maybe I could turn this into like a really cool serious shot and that's when I began kind of conceptualizing so many different aspects, so many different shots, uh, how things would um, come together. So when I wrapped up Hidden, uh, I took a little bit of a break from making projects and I was like, okay, this thing is just sitting here. I need to like come back in and finish this and, and complete this. So I started, um, but even in 2018, I kind of lacked some of the technical knowledge to create some of the shots because I knew it was going to be very FX heavy and I haven't really done a bunch of FX work. So like that shot that comes out the blaster when you kind of see that little uh, muscle flash explosion, that's all a Houdini sim. So I had to learn how to do that type of stuff. Also that big explosion at the end, um, that was all like Houdini uh, pyro and particle sims. I needed to learn how to do that. And even that was a challenge. The sim was like, uh, I think it was like over 200 gigabytes just for that sim and then another 
200 gigabytes for the particle sim. So just managing all that simulation data and then trying to get it to render, it was just like a, a whole challenge. How, how do I integrate those things with the scenes? Um, but for 20, the, coming down towards the end of uh, 2018, I really kind of jumped back into it full time. I did that for a couple of months. Then I had to work on a main title for semi-permanent uh, 2019. So that took some of my time. And then I worked with this uh, menswear company, Abbasi Rosborough, on their brand film. And that took up some more of my time. But a huge goal for me was to get this film out by the end of 2020. So um, by, I think, mid-October, I was like, I need to get this done. And I knew it was going to be an insane amount of work. So the regiment was pretty crazy. Uh, waking up 4 a.m., just working until uh, my day job at Cash App. So I work up until 9.15, 9.30, hop in the shower, go to work, work all day, come back home, probably work on it some more, and rinse and repeat uh, Saturdays, Sundays, work on it full time. And I pretty much did that full time uh, up until release. Uh, it was a very stressful time, but I set this deadline and I didn't want to miss it, especially when I put it out to the world that I was going to release it on December 19th, and I didn't want to miss that. Wow. So this thing had been in your mind for, sounds like almost two full years, but then like a real crunch and sprint at the end of it. Um, that's just incredible that you're learning Houdini as you go and need a specific um, effect. But I mean, that's an incredible testament to your hard work and commitment to pull off a film like this. Um, you know, your rollout of the film, I also was just super impressed how you really almost like a studio releasing a film built some hype. I think it was almost like two weeks out. I would see in my Instagram feed of like, hey, it's coming two weeks. And then like five days, three days, you were teasing it, teasing it. By the end of it, I was like extremely excited to see this film. Um, also, you know, where it seems like you were being quite intentional with how you rolled it out to get you know, maximum uh, number of people to be excited about it and check it out? Yes, exactly. Like, for me, that's also why I chose to put it on YouTube, which is a platform I don't usually use. But I knew if this video was to get mass views, it would have to be on a platform that was a little bit more easily accessible. And I think YouTube was a great platform for that. But also, you know, sometimes you just don't want to drop something and no one knows. So two weeks out, I just wanted to start building up the hype so people would know to look out for it. But also, um, it it really reinforces the deadline. So it's like the summer 15th, now it's out in the universe. You really can't miss it. So it really makes it uh, important. And, and I think that's the key to completing personal projects because a lot of people, we, we start personal projects and it just ends up lying on your hard drive for years. And I, I think if you don't, set deadlines that you can stick to then it's unlikely that that film is going to get finished and that's why i thought it was important to really put that out there to reinforce that this is a real deadline that needs to be met yeah that's great advice and i mean this is kind of the ultimate example for other artists for using uh, personal film ideas films concepts you're passionate about to advance your own career as you're saying people are reaching out to you and um yeah just absolutely incredible job um on the film do you have a favorite shot or sequence or moment in the film you know um for me i think the shot that i'm most proud of was the exploding shot because for a very long time i i planned that shot in particular because i really wanted something that felt like huge and grand and I really didn't know exactly how I was going to execute it. And I think it was like a week and a half before I released it. I really started to make some good progress with the simulation of the shot. And it was just so technically involved. Um, even rendering it gave me a lot of problems. So I guess from a technical aspect, I was very proud of that shot. But honestly, uh, I think... And I don't say this to toot my own horn, but I feel like there's so many good shots uh, that it's hard for me to particularly choose a, a favorite. There's, every aspect kind of took some type of challenge, which uh, I, I'm really happy that I overcame. But I think in particular that explosion, I was just happy that I got that done. Yeah, that is a great shot. And you're rendering all of this on your box where you are. Or are you farming some of this out? 
yeah, everything was rendered on my two machines at home. Wow. So my electricity bill probably is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I assume it's just running around the clock um, during this kind of crunch period. Now, on your website, you list some of your um, areas of specialization, and you list basically all the, the renderers, Octane, Redshift, Arnold, V-Ray. You mentioned that Redshift is your... Um, kind of standard bearer at the moment. Um, it's very interesting to see someone list all of them. Is it just that you've been in so many different studios and environments, you've been forced to learn the kind of ins and outs of each of these, or did you intentionally want to deep dive on all of them? So because I've been using Cinema for so many years, um, I started it in 2009. And back then, to get a really good render, like all... Well, I think you had to use this physical render or actually I'm not even sure that physical render was out yet. So I think it was just a standard renderer. So as the technology evolved, I just adopted it. So I first started with V-Ray and to learn V-Ray, you know, you had to really read the manual and understood, understand how the renderer worked from a technical point of view to get the things that you wanted done. So then Octane came out, which really changed the game for me because that enabled me to create things at home. So I took a deep dive into Octane, but I felt like some of the features that I was used to in V-Ray, because V-Ray is a biased renderer, it gives me a lot gives me a lot more control. Uh, I think was missing in Octane because Octane is unbiased. Um, actually, no, I tried Arnold before I got into Octane because Arnold had that really interactive um, IPR. So I took a, like a deep dive into that, but. The render times on Arnold was just so crazy and I couldn't really do anything at home. I had to outsource anything that I needed to render. So then when Octane came around and I was like, wow, I could just throw two, three GPUs into a box and I could render at home. I was like, okay, this is the renderer I was going to use. And then of course I missed some of the features. Then Redshift came out and I was like, whoa, this has the speed of Octane, if not faster, but all the flexibility of Fury. It's the perfect, way I like to look. I like to really kind of tweak all the little things. I like a lot of control um, in the renderer itself. And I love compositing. So I'll, I need the options of a really good multi-pass, multi-pass workflow. So that's why um, Redshift for me currently is my favorite uh, renderer to work with. Interesting. Yeah, it's it's um, always a great um, topic of debate. Everyone's kind of scrambling to figure out um what what they should use i feel like octane gets um a lot of complaints for stability um when you're working on such an intense film like the one you just did redshift perform you weren't getting crashes everything was really stable throughout production yeah this is the thing like in a especially with a deadline the last thing i need to be worrying about is technical errors and like why is this not rendering why is this not working and like redshift was like butter smooth every scene had like a bunch of stormtroopers, particles, just like a bunch of different things. And I just threw it on my uh, my little render farm here and it just chugged away uh, fine. I didn't really have to worry about redshift crashing at any period of time. It was extremely stable. The interesting thing too, I was using like the experimental versions of redshift and even the experimental versions are like rock solid stable for me when I was uh, creating this project. Um, but I guess the thing with renderers, right, a lot of them I learned from necessity because I just needed to see what the better option was. So that's why I had to jump into all these renderers because at that point in time, I had to because that's what you needed to do to get the best result. And fortunately, now I think for people getting into motion graphics, there's so many options that you could kind of choose the renderer that you prefer versus like, oh, I need to use Octane because it's the only thing that renders fast enough. Uh, a lot of options, definitely something for people to, to explore and learn over time. Um, so you, the Star Wars film is out. It's absolutely incredible. Um, millions of views. It's uh, an incredible achievement. Does it make you want to take a pause and take a breath from this world? Or does it inspire you to want to do like a follow-up, like another film within that world? Yeah, I'm definitely taking a pause from personal projects for the entire year. It takes a lot of, uh, it's, it's a tremendous personal and physical effort. Uh, you don't get a lot of sleep. You're 
you're not working out, you know, you might not be eating the best when doing a project like this, especially because I'm not working on it full time. Um, obviously, when I, I, I did this, I had a vision of, you know, how it would help my career. Um, again, it's more so a showcase of my skill set and just something I wanted to do because during the process, it really makes me happy to see all these things manifest that I originally planned a few years back. So, but if you're asking if I'm going to be working on anything else personally this year, right now I would say no, but you never know what comes up. Sure. No, I can understand, especially when you describe that kind of wake up at 4 a.m., get some time in, work a full day. That sounds um, incredibly intense. That's probably a good segue to talk about your day job. Um, you are currently full time with Cash App. Um, and again, we'll we'll put some of the work here along with this podcast, but some absolutely fun, zany um, stuff where you've kind of got these series of 3D shots with a dollar sign as kind of the key element. Um, and everything's very comedic, very fun, very light, some cool sound design. Um, talk to us about your role at Cash App and what the general um, kind of constraints they're giving you uh, for these projects. Yeah, so I started at Cash App in late 2018 as a freelancer. Um, I wasn't too familiar with the brand at the time, but you know, when I came in, I saw that they had this incredible brand that was very loose and very fun that kind of allowed the people that worked there, the artists that worked there to have a tremendous amount of flexibility and freedom in regards to the stuff that they made. And like one of the first pieces of feedback that I got was make it funkier, make it crazier, make it weirder. And I was like, okay, I can do that. And we have this thing called um, Cash App Fridays where we kind of do like a cash giveaway on a Friday. And sometimes you have like super cash out Fridays and there we, we, ha we create like a really cool graphic and I'm usually tapped to do those um, graphics. And in those instances, it's kind of like just do something incredible and cool with the, the dollar sign. So uh, they usually give me like little constraints. It's usually like a process of brainstorming with the team and we settle on, you know, something that's dope and, yeah, we, we created and you see the end result. It's, it's a lot of really fun, cool stuff. And it seems like it's a really wise or smart thing for brands to do is to, um, it, it seems almost built for the kind of social media age where it's not like the brand is taking itself so seriously or things are even the same color all the time. Like it is loose um, and it is open and that that must be, a really nice environment to create in, I would assume, as long as like, you know, that the process is good. But um, it just seems like a really, really smart thing that I don't really see a ton of brands um, doing. So that seems like a really cool role. You're enjoying your time with the company being full time? Yeah. Um, again, there's, there's not a lot of places I would have gone full time at. And I think they've built a really unique culture there that really put the artist first and creative first and again it, it's a it's a very unique place to work at and i couldn't see myself really working anywhere else full time it's, it's just like a really great environment to do creative things and very very happy working there yeah i mean some of these shots almost look like like fan art or someone who's just having fun that brands always kind of want to go and sponsor it's just interesting to see a brand have the foresight to like bring that in house and kind of and kind of drive that. I don't feel like I see a ton of examples. Are there other companies you're looking at as inspiration, or or do you feel like Cash App is like kind of on the cutting edge of this kind of uh, marketing or like what they're doing with their brand? Yeah, personally, like I haven't really seen any other brands doing that. So when I started working there, I was like, wow, this is really fresh. This is really new. You know, it's like when you look at social media culture, these are the things that people are looking at, right? From a strategic perspective, it seems like it would make sense to kind of tap into that type of creative. And, you know, for us, it's, it's, it's been going quite well. Well, I'm glad to hear you're enjoying your time there. You know, you, how, how many years were you freelancing before you went full time with them? So I started in 
started freelancing in late 2016 and went full time mid 2019. So I'll say about three years. Yeah, I mean, that's always kind of a, a point of conversation for people too the full time versus freelance. And, um, you know, I kind of wonder your, your take on that. Do you feel like you have a kind of better balance, better security, happier? You know, is it more stressful to be freelance? How did you kind of weigh those pros and cons? I think the cool thing about freelance is that it, it gave you the flexibility to work with a bunch of different studios and, you know, have different experiences. But coming down to my later years in freelance, I realized that the landscape was shifting more so from film and TV to a lot of tech, you know, um, just because I think the TV and film budgets might be getting a little bit smaller. And obviously the tech budgets are a little bit bigger, uh, more studios are kind of gravitating towards that work. So seeing this, I was like, well, it kind of makes sense to take a, a job full time in tech. Also, I still have the same type of flexibility with my life. Cash App has really good um, staff policies, really good benefits that help. You know, it's good because they give you so much responsibility and it's more so like you, you do something and you're responsible for it. It's not about just sitting in the office there, clocking your hours. It's more so about you getting the work done, which is a great way to approach um, work, especially when you're working with senior artists. So for me, it, it just seemed like it makes sense. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of another thing I wanted to ask you about too. Uh, you have a kind of unique vantage point. You're in New York City. Has most of your career been in New York? You didn't do a lot of time in LA, did you? Yeah, I did like a month in LA. I did some time in uh, Silicon Valley at Apple. Um, so, but mostly in New York. Yeah. You have that vantage point of kind of working at a lot of these really high-end places um, or a handful of high-end places in New York City, it, you do have an interesting vantage point on the industry. Um, so you feel like one thing you're seeing is a shift into tech. Um, you think it's putting pressure on other studios to have smaller teams do more with less kind of mentality? Or, um, yeah, I kind of wonder your, your take about that. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, if you look at the landscape in New York, like a lot of the traditional uh, powerhouses in motion design, the Eva Eva getting bigger or getting smaller or closing shop. Uh, say, for example, like the New York Imaginary Forces uh, comp studio that I worked at, they no longer have a studio in New York or, um, yeah, exactly. So some studios are even getting larger, like Buxy, for example, I hear that they're, they're really staffing up. Um, and other studios, you know, either moving or kind of consolidating their teams um, because softwares like cinema could do so much and if you find a few talented artists you get a lot more bang for your buck it, it's interesting i was saying um i was telling a buddy of mine yesterday that i think this has been the last decade has been a tough year for studios but an amazing decade for motion designers because i think what's been changing is who's doing the work because Whereas you needed to tap like a huge studio to get certain projects done, you could tap like a huge, you, you could tap like three or four talented artists to get the same project done. Um, and they make, those artists are making more money while the clients are paying less. So I think also because of the technology, how it's evolved over the years has made the barter entry a little bit cheaper. Um, you could grab a few GPUs, get some high-end machines, and you could pump out something like, you know, Star Wars The Last Stand, which, you know, in comparison to if a studio did it, would be hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of work. So again, you know, those things have be begin to kind of change the, the playing field. But what it has done is give um, artists more opportunities to charge higher fees to work directly with clients to benefit them directly. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting you mentioned that. I'm currently writing an article for the MoGraph Mentor blog about this very issue that we are seeing small teams, and your film is a great example, the Star Wars film, small teams do things that 10 years ago would have taken the largest studios in the world to accomplish. You know, 10, 15 years ago, the level of technical complexity and rendering and everything you just did with what did you maybe have five people in total working on that film and you did 
like a lion's share of it. Um, it's just a stunning shift in a reality on the ground. Um, and so that seems to put the emphasis on, or it places the value disproportionately on the vision of directors or the, the artistic ability of art directors or creative directors. Like there'll, there'll be more of an inequality. Like, like you're saying, like the best artists will make more, but you will need fewer artists. You will need fewer technicians. Uh, and so kind of the thrust of the article I'm working on is like, really focus on your art, really focus on those higher level things because the, you know, don't just be a technician. Although even as you were discussing in your film, you need a lot of technical ability to execute that. Um, so it seems like people who can marry that become just extremely valuable, almost in a kind of like one person doing the work of 10, just 10 years ago. Um, it's going to be really fascinating to see what that looks like now here in the 2020s. Yeah. And that's, kind of always been my professional strategy. It's always about how can you offer more value to the company that you're working with. And I think if you can conceptualize something and execute something, then I feel that adds more value to you as an artist, not necessarily saying that this is the path, you know, everyone needs to follow. There are certain things I can would never be able to do versus like a specialist would. Like I would never be um, as good of a character animator as David Lee, who was the character animator on Star Wars The Last Stand. Or um, the rigger Martin, like I will never be able to rig as good as he. Or, so that's why it's important to still have those specialist things. But I think for me personally, like if I could go into the door and pitch like, hey, I could conceptualize this for you and I could also create it, then you become a lot more valuable in the marketplace. Yeah. And it's easy to imagine if you and me are having this conversation in 2030 that the rigging, like there's software that can, like I, I do expect even some of these technical challenges to get easier and easier over time. Um, and I think that's where having a voice, directing your own work, doing personal work, uh, making your own art, having a perspective might be more valuable than ever. Um, and I think your, you know, your work is certainly um, a testament to that, but yeah, I agree. It's kind of like still both people still need to have maximum technical ability. Um, and that's kind of, you know, we can close on that kind of discussion too, of this kind of specialist versus generalist mentality. Is it fair to call you, you know, you on your website, you call yourself a C4D generalist and designer, but in a larger sense, you're still kind of a specialist in that you're working in 3d and you're working with this kind of, you know, these specific pieces of software and you're not just saying, Hey, I'm a motion designer, 2d, 3d, whatever. Um, I've always been of the mindset that specialists tend to be more successful on average than just someone who says, Oh, I do a little bit of, of everything. Um, especially if you're in a place like New York or Los Angeles, where you're building out a team of, of specific specialists, um, is, is that still your mentality to to have have your lane and really just go kind of 100% in that direction? Yeah, because from a marketing perspective, it's hard for you to say, like, I'm a jack of all trades because most people won't believe you, right? So I think it's easier to sell yourself as one thing than get into the door and be like, oh, well, you know, I can also composite and nuke or, well, I can also design versus saying that you're all these things up front. I think it's easier for you to showcase that you can do something well. For me, that's Cinema 4D, 3D stuff. Then also show that, well, my real strength is being able to work across the entire production pipeline for high level of proficiency. I could design, uh, animate, composite, and just send the whole thing out. And that's kind of how I uh, approach projects. And that's pretty much my role at Cash App as well. I can conceptualize something and just execute it from start to finish. Well, you know, again, congratulations on the film and your incredible portfolio, which we're going to link up. Um, what does uh, what does your 2020 look like? Personal goals, things that you're um, excited about? Well, the next thing on the docket is to create the making of for Star Wars The Last Stand. Mm. It's gonna oh, yes, please. <laughs> for people that kind of see like a behind the scenes, just how I approach the entire project. Because with something like this, again, it's about uh, planning the process. So, and, it, and it's good because I have 
the technical insight and I'm the one creating it, that I can plan based on my weaknesses. That's kind of how, I, again, I approach a project. So it's like, okay, what do I know I absolutely cannot do and what can I learn to do in the period of time that I have to create this project? And that's why I think the design and the approach is a very important part of the, the process. But also knowing that, you know, you could find talented people to work with. Say, for example, uh, Echoic um, Audio, they, they really came through in a clutch and delivered amazing sound design and music for the film. And they did this in such a short period of time. So I have to give them like a huge shout out because um, David, who I worked with, he is, they, they, they're phenomenal. They're phenomenal people to work with. I'm very fortunate for them to, to, to bless this film with their talent. Uh, again, buddies like David Lee and Turos and Martin, and my buddy Preston, who kind of came through and contributed their skills to the film. Um, they, they came in clutch to really help me get it uh, across the finish line. So doing that making of is, I think is important to really show the, the process and how we created the film. Um, I, on my vacation to Tobago, I shot a bunch of footage that I'm going to put together to make uh, a video. I think film is also important to helping your CG skills. So I'm going to do a lot more shooting this year. Um, you know, it's working on composition, really understand how the camera plays with imagery and seeing all the little things that you can recreate in CG to make your stuff feel more lifelike and more real. Uh, and I think being out in the field and capturing things really help to inform how you approach those things as a artist. So that's kind of like some of the things I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to in 2020. I'm also kind of curious to see how the industry, you know, is shaping up. And some people, uh, a lot of questions I've also been getting is from like young artists trying to figure out like what direction they should go in, what they should do career wise. And, I usually start by saying, try to figure out like what you like to do. Um, you know, I'm not saying if you like to model, you know, you should, you should model it. But if you're going to do that, you should be amazing at it. You should do good that people can't tell you no. And that's usually my advice when people ask me like, oh, should you generalize or be a specialist? Um, I think if you're going to be a generalist, I think it's important to be good at all the things that you do. So if you're going to composite, you need to be a good compositor and a good animator. And that was like a huge challenge for me. But fortunately, when I first started doing this, this is how I always approach projects. Because when I was 19, uh, I was in Tobago. I had no idea this was a whole industry. I just liked creating my ideas. So I would have an idea and I was like, well, how do I do it? And I just figured it out. And that's how I always approached the work that I did. And so being a generalist and creating something from start to finish is what I like. I like that process. Um, so that's why I became a generalist. But again, if someone feels like they want to do something that's more specialist, if you want to be a compositor, I think that's fine. Compositors are super valuable. Uh, if you want to be an animator, those guys are super valuable. I don't think there's anything wrong with that either. A big thank you to Sakani Solomon for coming on the podcast, talking about his latest film, Star Wars The Last Stand. We're going to post it here in the article. You can check out more of his work at SakaniMotionDesign.com or follow him on Vimeo at Vimeo.com backslash Sakani. Thanks for listening to the MoGraph Mentor podcast. For more information, check out MoGraphMentor.com. Thanks for listening.